would invite you to open with me in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing our series going through the Gospel of Matthew, the, the Gospel of Matthew that really reveals Jesus as the Messiah, as the King, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus as King uh, giving to his people, his new kingdom people, his way that the, his kingdom should function and the way his citizens should live within that kingdom. And the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 is known as the Beatitudes. That means the blessings. And Jesus at the beginning, before he, he starts to talk about how his kingdom citizens should live, first he begins to talk about who they are, what their character is. Of course, we know that the only way to be part of Christ's kingdom is to be born again by the Spirit of God, to turn from our sin in repentance and, and turn towards God with faith in Christ. And so this blessing that he pronounces, these blessings are on his born again, redeemed people. And so let's look uh, this morning, we're going to be focusing on verse 9. But of course, we're going to read the whole section just by way of reminder this morning. And so Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is a gift to us. It is a grace to us. Lord, the only way that we can know you is for you to reveal yourself to us, a gift from the greater to the lesser. Lord, as you've revealed yourself to us in creation, we can see glimpses of you. We can see glimpses of your nature, of your character. Lord, you've revealed yourself to us in the pages of Scripture, the written word. But Lord, most fully, you have revealed yourself to us in the word become flesh in your precious son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you have called us to be a part of his family, to be a part of that kingdom. Lord, help us as we study what it means to be a peacemaker today, that you would help us to see what it is you want us to see. Give us ears to hear what it is you want us to hear. Lord, that you would cause us, that you would help us by the power of your spirit to live as your kingdom people in the times and the seasons in which we live. Lord, the days that we are living in are dark days. We see darkness all around us, but you are the light of the world and you have called us, your people, to shine that light. Help us, Lord, to live as peacemakers. Help us, Lord, to, to understand what it means to be a peacemaker and therefore shine your light in this dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, just by way of reminder, this is describing not the natural man. This section of blessings is talking about someone who has been born again. And so all of these things, this poverty of spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, and then today the peacemakers, 
This is not just describing people that have a, a natural temperament towards these things. But really it's talking about the nature and the character of Christ that is birthed in us through the work of the Holy Spirit. That the natural man is not any of these things. As we've drilled down deeper into them, what we've seen is that none of us in and of ourselves are these things without the Holy Spirit working in us. But now called out of darkness, now called into Christ's kingdom, what does it look like? What does a kingdom citizen look like? The character and the nature. Also with all of these blessings, these beatitudes... What we found is that there is a surface level reading, a sort of if you just read it, you can, if you just read it and pass by, uh, it's detached from Jesus' words and and the context that he's speaking in. And that you can, you can take these words out of their context and, and, and misapply them and, and misunderstand them. And what we've seen each week is as we've gone just a little bit deeper beyond the surface and understood the context to which Jesus was speaking, we've seen that what Jesus is saying is, is much different than what we would hear if we just read this in our own cultural context. Though Jesus' words here are for all people in all times, when he speaks these words... He's speaking to a specific people who live in a specific context. And for us to really understand the message that Jesus is communicating, we we have to not hear them with 21st century American ears, but we need to hear these words with 1st century Jewish ears. And the 1st century Jews had a very rich and well-defined culture that was ordered and steeped in Scripture. A culture very much not like the one we live in today. And so we need to understand that if we just import our meanings and our definition into these words, we will completely misunderstand what Jesus is saying. How these people heard these words would have been filtered through the Old Testament, filtered through the, the, the word of God and, and, and the, the word that God had spoken and the law that God had given to his covenant people. And so with each of these beatitudes, what we found is that the Old Testament helps us to understand Jesus' words and to then make the proper application. We can't just rip these words out of the context and drop them into our current culture. And so this beatitude, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God or sons of God, is possibly, this applies, what I'm talking about here, applies possibly more to this one than any other when we think about what it means to be a peacemaker. So when you hear the word peacemaker, what do we think? I I think we have an idea about what that would look like. We probably maybe think of someone who just kind of goes along to get along, right? A peacemaker is someone who doesn't Rock the boat too much. Someone who doesn't ruffle others' feathers. An easygoing person, right? A peacemaker. But again, we're not talking about someone's natural temperament. We're talking about a work that the Holy Spirit produces in us. When we think about a peacemaker, we might think about someone who would do anything to avoid conflict. Or maybe even someone who's more noble, who who tries to get people who are at odds with each other to come to some sort of compromise. You give a little, you give a little, and everyone just kind of compromises, and then we will have peace. And we think of that as a peacemaker. And the reason we think this is because we have a specific way that we define the word peace. When we think of peace, what do you think of? Right? No war, right? The, the absence of conflict. We, we think of tranquility or quiet. But, but really, har- harmony is another good one. But for us to understand peacemaker... 
What we really must look at is not our definition of peace. And if you go look at peace in Webster's, it will literally say that, a state of tranquility or quiet, the absence of conflict. That's our definition today. But the Old Testament word for peace was much more than that. How many of you know what the Old Testament word for peace is in the Hebrew language? Shalom. Shalom. So Jesus here is a first century Jew when he talks about a peacemaker. He's drawing specifically from the Old Testament scriptures and their, con their concept of shalom. And so what Jesus here is saying, we could read it as this, blessed are the shalom makers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, when you read the Old Testament and you, you understand in Hebrew how often this word shalom is used, and in so many different contexts, it really begins to become a more vibrant term and means so much more than simply the absence of conflict. Shalom means well-being in the fullest sense of the word. Shalom can even mean, uh, talking about a full sense of well-being, can even mean physical health at times. Shalom can even mean prosperity. Shalom carries with it the context, the concept of salvation, mental health, redemption, contentedness. It is a, a concept of, of healing and wholeness and completeness in the full person. It means much, much more than simply the absence of conflict. We see an example of this in the high priestly prayer in Numbers chapter 6. The high priests were commanded to give this blessing upon the children of Israel. Number 6, the, the high priestly blessing goes like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Give you shalom. You look at this blessing of God's face shining on you, of God blessing you and, and keeping you and, and guarding you and being gracious to you and lifting up his countenance upon you. And all of that is summarized in that the Lord would give you shalom. The Lord would give you peace. Now, as you read the, the Old Testament and you, you look at the, the storyline of it, what you find is that God is the only author of shalom. That peace only comes from God. There is only one source of peace. And God only gives peace, shalom, to those who are in covenant with him. The only way to have shalom, the only way to have peace, is to be in covenant with God. And the promise that he makes to those who are faithful to that covenant is that they will experience his shalom, his blessing, his, his uh, wholeness, body, soul, and spirit. It is something that is much deeper, is something that is incredibly more profound than simply trying to keep people from arguing with each other. Then, okay, you want Mexican and you want Chinese, let's go get Italian, you know. Right? That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about those who bring shalom. We see an example of this in Deuteronomy 28. We're going to turn to quite a few passages this morning. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 are, are the blessings that God pronounces on those who live faithfully with him, those who faithfully obey his covenant. This whole chapter, these blessings are a picture of shalom. We, we could say that this is a, a, a whole 
uh, uh, one, from looking at it from one angle to the other, a picture of God giving peace. Deuteronomy 28, and again, God is the author of peace. Shalom only comes from being in covenant with God, and God only promises to give it to those who are faithful in obedience to keeping his word and his covenant. Again, we see an example of it here in Deuteronomy 28. I'll read through this quickly just so you get an idea of shalom. If you are faithful, and and this is Deuteronomy 28, this is Moses giving his final sermon to the children of Israel as they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. One generation has passed away, the next generation has arisen, and they're about to go into the promised land. God's, God's going to lead them into the land that he promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses is giving them a final charge, a final uh, word on how to live in the land that God is giving them. And he says, if you are faithful, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments that I command you today... The Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall, you, shall, shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle the increase of your herds and the young of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you and in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord your God will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth, that's the nations, they shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open you to his good treasury, the heavens, to give you rain to your land in its season, to bless all the work of your hands, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you Be the head and not the tail, and you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods or serve them. Verse 15, he paints the opposite picture. He says, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. I'm not going to take time to read those this morning. I would encourage you to read this later. It's the exact opposite. I want you to notice here the conditional part of this blessing. If, if you are faithful to obey, I promise to give you my peace, my shalom, my wholeness in every area of your life. Now, as you study the Old Testament uh, storyline, what do we find? Do we find that they were faithful to the covenant or unfaithful? They were unfaithful. 
There were times and seasons of, of great covenant faithfulness. And when they were faithful to God as a people, as a nation, what did we see but the blessing of God poured out upon them? The peace of God, the shalom of God. But when they were unfaithful, what did we find would happen? It was the opposite. God promises his peace to those who are in covenant with him and who are faithful to keep that covenant that we will experience his shalom. Now the problem for humanity as a whole is that all of us are covenant breakers. We have all broken God's covenant. We have all transgressed his law. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's law. Therefore, we need a redeemer. Because man in his natural state and man left to himself is sinful, is someone who does not live in peace with God, but rather has himself as a rebel declared war on his maker and his creator. And so for us to experience shalom, for us to experience covenant relationship with God, for us to uh, live truly fully as God made us, as his image bearers, we must be reconciled to God. We must have our sins forgiven. We, we need our right standing with God to be restored. And the, the bad news of the gospel, which is good news, but the bad news is there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves. That our goodness, our righteousness is as filthy rags before God who is holy. And so the, the Old Testament prophets, they begin to speak of a coming redeemer. They begin to speak of a coming king. They begin to speak of one who will restore peace with God. Who will make a way for humanity who is lost and sinful and unfaithful and covenant breakers to be restored to a new covenant with God. We read about that in Isaiah. I mean, you read about it the whole Old Testament. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 was not written by the Hallmark Company for Christmas cards. It was written as a prophetic declaration of the ministry of the reconciling work of Christ. Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at a few uh, verses here this morning. Look at verse number 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep, deep darkness on them light has shined or light has dawned. Matthew earlier we saw that he used this very passage to say the dawning of that new light, the dawning of that new day, though humanity has been in darkness because of sin, that when Jesus came into the world, it was the dawning of a new day. Amen. That those who have lived in darkness, a new light has dawned for them. In verse 6, it says this, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to establish a kingdom, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Again, not the prince of the absence of conflict, but the prince of one who will bring God's shalom back to his covenant people. The people, the, the prince of, of, of God who will bring to us the full wholeness that God intends for us to live in. The prince of peace. Of the increase, it says, of the increase of his government and of peace, shalom, there will be no end. That when he establishes his kingdom and he, he, he establishes it here on earth, 
that as his work is accomplished, that his kingdom will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And where his kingdom goes, there you will find peace, shalom. Of the increase of his government and of shalom, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And how do we know that this will be accomplished? Because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the work of the Messiah. This is the work of the King. Though we live in, in, in conflict with God, though we live in enmity with God as natural man, that Jesus came to restore peace with God. And that that peace with God would produce in us a healing work that would restore us, restore us back to God's intent as his image bearers. Flip with me to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians in the New Testament. Colossians 1, let's look at verse. The problem with Paul is everything is a run-on sentence. So it's like, you just start in verse, to to look at something in chapter 4, you got to start in chapter 1, verse 1. But um, let's look at, uh, we'll start in verse 17. Colossians 1, verse 17. And he, speaking of Jesus, remember, we need a redeemer. We need someone to reconcile us to God. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. This is why when you remove Christ from anything, you immediate, it immediately starts to disintegrate. So why, why are families disintegrating today? Well, because Christ is not in the family. Why are institutions that once used to be the, the envy of the world disintegrating right in front of our eyes today because you've removed Christ from them? Wherever, in Christ, all things hold together. You remove Christ and everything begins to disintegrate. Well, <laughs> you, could, you could also make the argument for why the church is so weak in America today. Because we've substituted Christ for entertainment. And the preaching of the gospel is absent from the pulpit. In him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. The beginning. Something new started with Christ. The firstborn from the dead. The, The prototype, if you will. For for all of us who would believe upon him. That in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace by the blood of God. Of his cross. He has made peace. He has made shalom. He has brought well being in the fullness, fullest sense salvation and redemption and healing to the soul by the blood of his cross. And then he applies this to us, verse 21 You who once were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in the blood and the body of his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. This is the work of Christ. 
Though we are lost, though we are dead in our sins, though we are alienated and enemies of God, he came to make peace. So much more than the absence of conflict to heal us, to restore us, to bring us back to that place of original intent that we might exercise dominion in his kingdom and call others back into covenant faithfulness with God. This is the work of Christ. The work of the enemy, Jesus says, is to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. The abundant life is shalom. That peace that he came to bring. Jesus says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy them. So we were once alienated from God, hostile in mind. But through the blood of his cross, he has made peace. And we have now been reconciled by his death. And he is now making us holy. And one day will present us blameless and above reproach. Flip back with me just a couple pages, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Again, we run into the same problem with where to start, but let's start in verse 14. Ephesians 2, 14, speaking of Jesus. Now let's start in verse 13. No, let's start in verse 11. Sorry, it's just, it's just real. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, but what is called the circumcision, the, the, the Jew and Gentile distinction. Remember, verse 12, that you were at one time separated from Christ. That, that's part of taking communion is that we remember this do in remembrance of me. We remember the work of Christ. We remember who we were before Christ. We remember who we would be apart from Christ. Remember, he says, don't forget that at one point we were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. That, that's the covenants Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Listen, there is no hope apart from Christ. Christ is our only hope in life and in death. That's it. That's all we have to hang our hat on. Not only in the future, but right now. He is our hope. And in the world separated from God, we have no hope. But, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by your own good works and efforts and deeds. You've been brought near to God by your own righteousness, your own goodness. You've worked really hard. You've done a really good job. And so God is now pleased with you. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that, but now in Christ Jesus, we who were separated, we who were afar off, we have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He himself is our peace. We need a redeemer. We need a reconciler. We need someone who can restore us back to God. And he is that redeemer. One last passage today, John 14. Flip over with me to the left a few more pages. John 14.
verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus says, peace I give to you, my peace I give to you. Listen, Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience and submission to the law of God. He perfectly kept God's law. He never once broke covenant with God. He he lived his whole life in perfect peace with God, perfect shalom with God, wholeness and and well-being in the fullness sense of the word. And Jesus says, that peace that I have with God, I give to you. That fellowship that I have with God, I give to you. We know that Jesus went to the cross and at the cross in our place, he experienced our separation on our behalf. On the cross, Jesus was separated from the Father. The the punishment and penalty for sin poured out upon Christ. Our sin poured out upon him. So that Jesus cries out on the cross, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross experienced the alienation from God that we experience in our natural man so that we, through faith in him, could experience the perfect peace that he shared with God from all eternity past. The unity, the the commitment, the fellowship, the closeness, the intimacy between the Father and the Son, he calls us into that and he promises to give us that through faith in his name. This is what peace looks like. Being restored back to fellowship with God. In the fullness sense of the word. And there's only one way to be reconciled back to God. There's only one way to have fellowship with God or peace with God. It is through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is abundantly clear. There is no other way. God is the giver and author of shalom, of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. If we are going to experience peace with God and in the world, it is only through a relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, we as Christians... We believe that, amen? But what we have to be very careful of is that we don't fall into the lie of our day which says that's okay for us as Christians but other people can find peace other ways. That that other people can can find wholeness and, and, and completeness and contentment and, and total satisfaction in their body, soul, and spirit other ways and other means. You see, we live in a world that preaches to us that message. We are told constantly that we live in a pluralistic society and that we as Christians cannot uh, impose or enforce or declare our beliefs in the public square because we all just have to go along to get along. And then people who don't understand the Bible say, you Christians ought to be peacemakers. Therefore, just go along to get along. But we as Christians know there is only one way to have true peace, true peace, Forgiveness, true healing, true satisfaction. And it is only found in one place, and that is in Jesus Christ. And so let us not be like so many today who would say, I believe in Jesus, I have faith in Jesus, he is my Savior and my Lord. 
but everybody else just can do, they'll, they'll just do their own thing and, and they'll find happiness and peace their own way. Jesus says there is no other way. The gospel says there is no other way. The gospel says the only way to have peace with God and true happiness, blessedness, contentment is in fellowship with the triune God through the work of the Son, Jesus Christ. So, with that introduction out of the way on the word peace, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. To be a peacemaker, number one, I'll give you three things. Number one, you must be committed to spreading the gospel of peace through declaring the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Christ, our peacemaker, has sent us into the world to establish his peace over all the earth. That's the Great Commission. So to be a peacemaker is one who is committed to this ministry of declaring the gospel of peace. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about it this way, that we are ministers of reconciliation. That we, come, we call on to people and we say, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. There's only one way. It's through faith in Christ. So to be a peacemaker, I must be committing to spreading the gospel of peace. Number two, we must personally be committed to covenant faithfulness with God by obeying his law and his word. This means that we, as, as those who have been reconciled to God, we have been set free of sin, which is lawlessness. We are not set free by by, by the work of Christ set free from sin and lawlessness so that we might go back into sin and lawlessness. No. Satan is called the lawless one. To be a peacemaker means that we must live a life of shalom. We must live a life that is committed to covenant faithfulness with God by obeying his word. This means applying God's word to every area of thought and life. And when we do that, we will experience the shalom of God in every area of our lives. Amen. Number three, to be a peacemaker does not mean compromise with the world. The Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? There is only one way for sinful humanity to have peace with God, and that is by laying down their arms and surrendering. There is no compromise. Any compromise with the world is living in rebellion against God. And living in rebellion against God will not produce the peace of God. A peacemaker does not compromise with the world or the ways of the world or the thinking of the world. There is no blessing. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says, but there is no blessing on surrendering to evil and calling it peace. To be a peacemaker means that we call people to surrender to the Prince of Peace. We call people into covenant fellowship with God through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. That is the only pathway to peace. Surrendering to evil being a, a, just someone who avoids conflict, that is not peace that will not produce peace, not in biblical terms. It, it may let sleeping dogs lie. It, it may just sort of not, uh, uh, you know, rock the boat too much. But what we must see as Christians is that we have hit an iceberg. 
it is time to rock the boat. It is time for, to call people off this sinking ship and into the ark, into the church, into covenant faithfulness with God, into another way. Because if people stay on this sinking ship, they will perish. And to think that we are obeying the commands of Christ by watching people on their pathway to destruction and not saying anything is to live a life completely opposite to what Jesus is talking about here as being a peacemaker. There is no blessing on surrendering to evil and calling it peace. And the blessing that Jesus pronounces on those peacemakers is that we will be called sons or children of God. What does this mean? This means that peacemakers, those who go out to proclaim the gospel and to bring people back into fellowship with God, to be reconcilers back to God, they are showing the true nature and the character of God. God is the reconciler. God is the one who, who left heaven and came to earth, who came to seek and to save the lost. That is the nature and character of God. And so us, by being a peacemaker in that way, we show that we are true children of God. That his spirit is alive inside of us. And as we seek to reconcile people to God, we are doing the work of Christ as his children. Amen? I invite you to stand with me this morning. What we must realize, we must see this. Is that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That sin produces death. And oftentimes we think what it means to be a Christian that the highest Christian virtue is to be nice. And we want people to think that we're nice. And so we see people living in sin. We see people who are on a pathway to destruction. And we don't say anything. And we think, well, well maybe it'll work out for them. It won't. And that's what we must see. We must see that unless God intervenes, uh, unless God brings reconciliation, unless God brings salvation, that the pathway of sin leads to death. And we are called to be those peacemakers, to fight for peace. To be ones who will engage with the message of reconciliation. To, to be those who will in love. I'm not saying to be ugly, to be mean, to be rude. But, but we must see the reality of where the paths of our loved ones lead. And be willing to to pray, to intercede till our heart is broken and then we can go with tears and say this path leads to death. But there is a path that leads to life. There is a path that leads to peace with God. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about what he's done for me. Let me tell you about what he will do for you because he is no respecter of persons. But we must wash our minds of the lie that our culture says 24-7. Is that there's lots of different paths and they all lead to happiness. We have to be peacemakers. 
people of reconciliation, people who will, will lead people to the only place that they will find true shalom. That is through faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to be gripped by this calling that you've called us to. Lord, you, you said that as the Father sent you, so you have now sent us. Just as you came as the Prince of Peace to bring reconciliation, so now you have commissioned us as your agents to spread that message throughout the whole world. Lord, help us to be committed to those ends and committed to your word and to putting it into practice in our life. And Lord, that as our convictions grow, that we would experience your peace and your shalom in ever-increasing ways. Lord, that you would cause us to be faithful witnesses in word, in deed, in thought, in action. Lord, we will not be perfect, but you have given us your spirit. And by your spirit, you work through us. We thank you for that today. Lord, as we go out from here, we go out as missionaries. We go out carrying the light, the only true light. Lord, help us to go out with love and joy and peace. Proclaiming the good news of the gospel, the, the grace of God and the peace of God. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.